The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, um, I'm glad you could join us this afternoon. I do apologise for that slight technical issue, but hopefully we're all here and everything's going to go very smoothly for the rest of this webinar. So um, yeah, thank you very much for coming along. Um, so this afternoon we're going to obviously be looking at UCAS personal statements kind of guidance and looking at how best you can kind of support the students that you work with. So just a bit about me, I'm Sarah, I'm actually an outreach officer at the University of Gloucestershire. Um, I'm delivering this webinar today on behalf of GROWS which is the NNCO for Gloucestershire. Uh, so part of my role as an outreach officer includes kind of delivering talks and workshops to kind of support students with their personal statements and their kind of UCAS applications in general. And before this, I actually worked in secondary education for six years um, as a teacher and I had experience kind of helping students with their UCAS personal statements and also writing their um, references as well. So hopefully a kind of broad range of experience. Um, I've also got Jess on hand with me today and she's actually going to be monitoring your comments and your questions. Um, we'll try our best to get these answered in the session, but we do intend on kind of collating these and pro producing a sort of FAQs document um, which you can access after the webinar. Um, we're also recording this session and it will be available on the GROWS website, which is GROWS, G -R -O us.ac.uk and, and that will be kind of in the resources section so you can go and find a copy there alongside all those kind of frequently asked questions which hopefully we'll have, we'll have answered for you. Um, so I'm sure many of you have already had experience kind of advising students about their um, personal statements but I hope that this um, session might serve as something of a kind of refresher. Uh, there's actually been some new research published from the Sutton Trust, some of you may have um, read it, it was um, making a statement and this has shown that kind of teachers views on what makes a really good statement can be very different from uh, uni university admissions tutors. So I'm really hoping that this session will kind of address some of those issues. Okay, I've got um, a couple of people saying that the sound, having a few troubles with sound, so hopefully I've got the microphone a little bit closer now, but do let me know if that is causing you a problem and I'll do my best to try and resolve it. Okay, so before we start, just to go over a kind of couple of technical things for those of you who maybe haven't used the kind of go-to webinar um, service before. So here on my screen, you should be able to see um, a kind of a copy of a screenshot of the control panel. It should look a little bit like the one that you've got on your screen. So you can use the orange arrow to actually expand the control panel. Um, and in terms of volume, I do think that's probably easiest for you to try and control from your end just by, you know, looking at your um, at the control panel that you've got on your own um, PC. Um, we're going to have a little practice, though, of some of the tools that you can use to kind of interact with us on the webinar today. Okay, so first of all, we're going to do a little practice. Um, and we're going to practice with the kind of hand raising tool, which you can see. It's got a little picture of a hand. So first of all, to have a practice with this, I would like you to raise your hand if you actually remember writing your own personal statements. If you've had to write your own personal statement, if, if you're applying for university, if you could raise your hand now. Okay, it's quite a few, maybe about half of us. Okay, so secondly, I want you to actually raise your hand if you've actually helped students write personal statements before. Oh, I think that's pretty much all of us. Okay, and finally, if you have absolutely no experience at all of personal statement writing, so I can just see if we've got a few novices in the room. Oh, a couple. I'm not going to show you up or anything, but okay, that just kind of gives me an, a, a kind of flavour of uh, where, where you're all coming from today. 
Okay, so the next thing what we're going to do is have a look at actually asking questions or making comments and like I said I've got Jess on hand who will be kind of monitoring that for me today. So um, just in the kind of questions comments box I would like you to write down um, your role and the kind of institution that you represent, so school, if you're at a university, if it's something else entirely um, and I also think it might be quite nice if perhaps if you let us know, are you kind of on your own or maybe you're there with a group of colleagues, if you kind of let us know, you know, your situation, so who are you with today? So I'll just give you a moment to write that down. Okay, so Kelly, the support officer, we've got head of careers, careers advisors, outreach assistants. Okay, we've got a few tutors. All right, it's quite varied. Um, student guidance, that sort of thing. Okay, this is really good and, you know, obviously I'm sure lots of you have things that would be good, so if you maybe have any kind of tips or things that you'd like to share with the other people who are also in attendance with the webinar today, then please go ahead and do so because it would be really good and we can obviously add all of those little comments to those FAQs at the end of the session as well. Okay, please let me know if I'm moving through things too quickly. So let's get kind of stuck into what we're going to be looking at today. So first of all, um, I think it's really important to stress to students exactly how important the personal statement is for them. So, you know, it's the only part where they really have kind of full control over that part of the application. If you think that the predicted grades and the references are kind of decided or written by tutors, you know, such as yourselves, um, and also that, that an awful lot of courses don't actually interview, it's the only chance for them to kind of showcase themselves as this kind of rounded individual, and we'll go, we'll go into that a little bit more later on. Um, I'll also discuss the kind of type of content and style that HE institutions were looking for. Um, you know, obviously, I'm not saying this from the point of view, kind of a guru of everything, but this is the sort of thing from talking to my colleagues and people from kind of other institutions. These are the sorts of messages that are kind of coming out of what we say we look for in a really strong personal statement. And of course, we'll also um, go over some kind of top tips um, to ensure that your students don't fall in fall for the kind of common pitfalls of personal statement writing, which are all too easy, I think, to fall into sometimes. Okay, so I'm sure that most of you, um, you've all kind of helped write personal statements before nearly all of you, but most of you will be already familiar with the UCAS form already, but kind of just a reminder that the, the, these are the kind of main sections. So you've got the personal details and you know other things that I would say to kind of remind your students about, um, that they should always use a sensible email, um, email address, you know, not that one that perhaps they made up when they were about 12 years old, which is quite funny at the time, but maybe not something they'd want to share with um, universities. Um, and also to make sure it's accessible, so i.e. you know, not a school or college email address that they might not have access to beyond the summer. So Google, Hotmail, something like that would work best. Obviously, they can apply for up to five courses. They don't necessarily have to be at five different institutions. Just to remind them, of course, you know, £12 for one or £23 if they're applying for more than one. Um, for those of you who perhaps aren't sure, so most students would complete their application by the 15th of January. Of course, that's earlier for, for Oxbridge, uh, medicine, veterinary sciences, things like that. Um, but I'd always stress to them, of course, that you know their school or college deadline is going to be much earlier than 15th of January to kind of allow for proofreading and for their tutor to write their reference and so on. And I would always, always encourage them to kind of get that to whoever's writing their reference nice and early so it's not, you know, two days before the Christmas holiday. Um, you want to make sure that they're putting their reference writer in a nice good mood when they're going to write that to kind of give them the best possible position that they can. 
Um, in terms of qualifications, that's everything that goes down that's kind of GCSE and beyond. Um, I would really recommend getting your students to look on the UCAS website. There is a really comprehensive list of all sorts of other kind of weird and wonderful qualifications um, which can actually get them UCAS points as well. So I think kind of things like grade six and above, um, music, um, practical and theory, um, I think there are some sort of dance and drama qualifications, key skills, all sorts of things. So I'd really get them to look on there to kind of see if they can maybe grab a couple of extra points, which could be the difference between getting in, perhaps, or just mi narrowly missing out on that place. Um, I will go over a little bit later in the presentation, obviously with the kind of move to linear qualifications for lots of students, that will mean that ined inevitably there'll be kind of even more emphasis on having a really strong personal statement. So it's not just those um, qualifications which carry the weight. And also, of course, there's the reference, which I think an awful lot of you will be having an input in. So potentially, these kind of carry more weight for admissions tutors than the personal statements. There has been research to suggest, you know, that they would put more weight on a reference. Possibly, you know, it's a little bit more impartial. You're looking more at the kind of academic side of things. Though, of course, I wouldn't tell students that because you want them to feel that their personal statement needs to be really, really strong. Um, and again, you know, this personal statement is the chance for universities to kind of meet the student, as it were. Okay, so the personal statement itself is about one side of A4, um, it gives them about 1,000 to 4,000 characters, or I always say 28 tweets, I know lots of them are quite into their social media, so you know, get them thinking, how would they kind of sell themselves to a university in just 28 tweets. Um, 47 lines, which kind of includes blank lines as well, so obviously those who are always writing furiously and um, asking for extra paper and exams, um, make sure they're kind of cutting down on the waffle and also kind of trying out little tricks such as, you know, using the indent um, to represent a new paragraph rather than leaving a whole blank line. Obviously, they can't have any formatting. I'm sure most of you have seen kind of the form. It's very sort of boring, really. Um, so no bold italics underlining, anything like that to make things stand out. So I always say, you know, get your students kind of dust off those GCSE English skills if they haven't used them for a while and think about how they can structure paragraphs, sentences effectively to kind of highlight the, the, the kind of the most positive or the most important attributes that they might have in their personal statement. Okay, it kind of goes without saying really that it's much easier to use something like Word or kind of a similar package um, when they're writing their statement. Obviously they can kind of edit these more easily, send them to tutors to um, who are going to be writing their reference. They can share them with friends and family for kind of proofreading purposes. Um, and it's much easier to kind of work offline in order to write that. Um, I would suggest that they check the character and line count really carefully because if when copying and pasting from Word into UCAS apply, um, just to double check that the kind of nothing's gone wrong, that they you know they maybe missed a couple of characters, anything like that. So use the guide that is actually provided, which you can see on that screenshot there on the right hand side, to get them to kind of check. Um, how many characters they've got left and how many lines they've got left when they look at it on the kind of apply page. Um, also stress to them, of course, that when they save in UCAS Apply, um, it, it is, of course, a machine. It doesn't really have nice feelings. So, of course, if they've accidentally pinged off their personal statement um, with half a sentence missing or half a word missing, that could be a bit embarrassing if they're sending that off to um, universities. Um, also ensure that they save regularly, um, apply will time out after 35 minutes, so if they maybe receive a really exciting phone call or something like that and end up running off for 36 minutes, when they pop back they'll have potentially lost everything they've done. So again, stress to them to, that they should save. Of course, by saving, um, that doesn't kind of send it off to the universities at all. That's not until they submit it. It just keeps what they've done so far safe. Um, 
I'd also really stress the importance of spelling and grammar checks. I'm sure you do anyway, but you know, you will know obviously how much your students have tried, how many hours have gone into perfecting this statement, you know, blood, sweat and tears and everything else. But you can just imagine that um, a, you know, a single spelling error could possibly give maybe a kind of sloppy impression and that could undo all of the hard work that they've put in. All right, so that's enough really about the mechanics. Next, we're going to have a little look at what to say. So I'll just pause here for a moment and see if anybody has any um, questions that they'd like to ask or any comments about the actual um, completion of the form perhaps. And of course, you know, Jess is going to be um, jotting down those and we'll get back to you with all of the answers at the end if we're kind of running out of time. Okay, so when actually looking at kind of what to say, in the personal statement. Um, two thirds of it should relate to the course that the student's actually applying for. So, you know, whilst they might be a champion paraglider or a kind of YouTube sensation, unless they actually relate these facts to the course, they're simply wasting valuable space. Um, there's no need for your students to provide a kind of a long biography of where they've lived, worked, studied, because of course institutions will have access to the whole application form. And that include that includes includes a kind of place of study and qualifications. Um, likewise, I know some schools like to put in the reference kind of a long um, biography or a little kind of background information about the type of school that they've attended. I think it can be better sometimes to create a hidden link on your school website and to actually pop the link for that into the state into the reference because it just sort of saves using up um, time for the for those quite kind of generic sort of comments that um, necessar don't necessarily re reflect that student as an individual. So um, they should really focus on their interests, their experience, and their kind of skills that they developed in their level two and level three courses, and and you know what they're hoping beyond, you know, and what they're doing outside of that. I always think that students should focus on what is their unique selling point, you know, what makes them different from everyone else who's applying for that course. So I always say, if your whole class removed their name from their statement and handed them in to you, would you, as your tutor, would you be able to give back the correct the statement, the correct statement to the correct person? You know, you should be able to kind of say to them, oh, you know, you're the one who volunteers with your little brother's football team every Sunday, or, you know, you're the one who visited Spain on an art and design research trip at Easter, or you're the one who read the complete works of Shakespeare last summer. You know, what is it that they, they're doing that's kind of different or a little bit more or a little bit extra, but is kind of unique to them and it's not the same as everybody else in their class or in their year group? Um, when it comes to kind of extenuating circumstances, so that could be something like, you know, personal illness or maybe um, family trauma, I think it's best to have a conversation with the student about this. So I think it's sometimes better for these details to kind of come in the personal statement rather than in the reference. Um, but again, I'd kind of get them to focus on the positives, so how they kind of overcame a really difficult situation rather than kind of providing it as sort of excuse or sob story. You know, otherwise it can kind of become a little bit like X factor, can't it? And get, you get the feeling that maybe they're kind of going for the sympathy vote rather than getting through kind of on their own merit. So with that in mind, there are... Um, two really important questions that applicants must answer in their statement. So we're going to look at these next. I think these are the two kind of key burning questions that they should kind of write down at the centre of their paper when they're doing their planning. So the first one, why are you applying for the course? Okay, that might sound kind of obvious, but your students will obviously have kind of chosen an area of study, but what was it that actually sparked their interest in this? Okay, so, you know, if they're kind of 
applying for economics, for example, was it their GCSE maths teacher who then kind of inspired them con to consider economics at A-level and that hence, you know, why they then want to continue that on perhaps at degree level as well? Was it um, testing out perhaps A-level French or on a family holiday that made them want to kind of develop their love of languages and apply for, for that again at degree level? Um, perhaps it was something like, you know, caring for an elderly relative that actually prompted them to choose um, perhaps a level three health and social care type of course and that they want to kind of continue this further. So, Drawing on personal experiences should be the kind of justification for the course choice. I think that's really essential. Um, you know, is it work experience? Is it a personal project that perhaps they worked on? One of you actually mentioned the EPQ. So perhaps, you know, did they choose something for EPQ that's kind of sparked their interest for this subject area and they want to kind of develop it further? Um, Perhaps it's their hobby, perhaps it's a voluntary work that they've done. Um, have they been on a summer school? I know some of you, you know, from different universities, perhaps like um, we offer um, a residential um, summer school event for, our year, for year 10s and year 12s to come on and they get to kind of have subject tasters and things at, at those events. So perhaps it was something like that that inspired one of your students. Um, is it extra reading that they've done? Have they kind of watched any interesting um, videos, things like TED Talks perhaps they've watched online which have kind of sparked their interest in this, in this um, area of study? However, it's no use kind of just demonstrating enthusiasm. They need to really provide evidence that they understand kind of what the course is going to be about and kind of what's required. So, um, you know, it, it would be a really bad example to say that, oh, watching CS CSI is their kind of reason for wanting to study forensics. And I think likewise stating that... Um, that you enjoy working with children would be a really bad reason for applying for midwifery and you're probably going to spend more of your time working obviously with the kind of the mother than you would be with the actual child. Um, I would get students to read course descriptions and prospectuses and on websites really really carefully um, get them to focus on on specific parts of the course perhaps refer to particular modules um, that are that they know that they'll be covering or particular topics or experiences that they know that they'll be able to gain on the course um, which is perhaps telling them you know why they wanted to to apply for it I will go over more of that later but um, as you will probably know they only get one personal statement for all of the courses that they're applying to so we'll kind of go over how not to alienate institutions um, by mentioning things that aren't relevant to them um, and also I think future plans so I think it's really important that they perhaps show they've got some sense of where they might be going what are their plans after graduation so Perhaps the students are applying because they have a particular career in mind, you know, such as teaching or obviously veterinary work, and they know that they need a degree level qualification in order to achieve that or to get to that. Um, even if they're kind of unsure, I think it's good to mention future plans. It tells universities that students have really thought about their future and they aren't just applying because it's the kind of the next step on the ladder, all their friends are doing it, they're, they're too scared to move into the world of work. Um, I can tell you now, universities are certainly not going to hunt down students and take away their degrees because they didn't follow the career path that was kind of outlined in their personal statement. But having some sense of thinking about their future and where they think their degree will take them always looks positive. Okay, you're probably wondering, right, what is this second really important burning question? So why are you suitable? All right, so all about suitability. Students may seem really super enthusiastic, but they also need to provide some sort of guarantee that they'll be successful. Um, so obviously, you know, if they're investing in the institution, but the institution is also investing in them too. So, you know, they want to prove that they're perhaps not going to kind of drop out of the course or they're going to find that they're ill suited for the course in some way when they're kind of part way through. So I always think, get them thinking about what makes them university ready. Um, so universities will already have access to their overall predicted grades, but perhaps there's a particular module or a piece of coursework, maybe a presentation where they've really excelled. So 
you know, could they kind of describe what that was and explain why? Why did they do really well in it? And why do they think that that will help them on their future course? Um, perhaps it's that they've really honed something like um, a particular skill. Maybe they're referencing skills in their psychology work, or maybe they've developed really good customer relations on one of their travel and tourism placements. So, you know, get them to focus on what they've done. Um, I sort of mentioned earlier the idea of kind of looking for rounded individuals. So I think employers are keener than ever to employ graduates who are these kind of rounded individuals, not just a qualification on a piece of paper. So they need to show that there's more to them than that. And I think, you know, even, even if you were lucky enough to receive an A star in history, that might simply reveal that this is a student who's really good at passing exams. It doesn't necessarily show that they really enjoy studying the subject. Um, so students should kind of explain what they've done above and beyond the course expectations. Um, you know, are they the sort of person where they're set one chapter, but then they kind of go and read two or three chapters of the book, or perhaps even the, the kind of book in its entirety. Um, have they perhaps undertaken voluntary work in the field? Have they taken on an extra project, you know, such as the EPQ, which I mentioned? Have they et entered any kind of academic competitions? Have they set up a blog? I know loads of students at the moment, you know, they're really into their kind of social media. Um, are they kind of active participants on forums? Do they create their own kind of um, YouTube channel, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, have they watched documentaries, you know, on the subject? What have they done that kind of shows that they have done that little bit extra and they have that kind of, you know, deep understanding and kind of willing to go further in order to progress on their course? And all that shows is their kind of commitment to the course, their commitment to the subject, and it tells universities that they'll be willing and eager to learn independently. Okay, extracurricular activities, so obviously students are kind of really into doing a little bit more in their free time, but I think that's good, but they should link all of that to their proposed course of study. So, you know, get students to think, why does this experience, interest or activity that I do in my free time make me a good candidate for this university course? So. You know, a part-time job in a cafe might not seem relevant to their degree course, but actually it could show kind of teamwork, it could maybe show trustworthiness when they're kind of working on the till. If they're quite sporty, it might be that all those kind of early morning training sessions for kind of swimming competitions actually helps to show kind of dedication, it shows really good time management. So it's all about linking the experience to kind of these soft skills that would make them good potential university learners. Um, if students are perhaps planning to move away from home, perhaps they also might want to kind of indicate their competence for independent living as well, show evidence that they're um, capable and excited about kind of working out of their comfort zone or maybe meeting and working with um, completely new people. Really importantly though, make sure that students can back up everything. Okay, they could be quizzed on this if they're called for interview, um, even during clearing, of course, you know, the, the same personal statement would have to be used if they go through into clearing, and some institutions will actually carry out kind of mini telephone interviews with students during the clearing period, and they will, of course, use the personal statement as a kind of basis for those questions. So making sure that everything they said is true, but also that they kind of back up any skills or experiences that they say that they have, they can kind of back those up with evidence. Okay, so if anyone has any questions or comments again about the content, then please, you know, jot those down, put those in the chat box, um, and then Jess and I will kind of get back to you on, on any of that. Okay, so 
I've already said this before, but, you know, one application for all choices. So it's really important that students avoid kind of alienating any institutions, either, you know, the most glaringly obvious thing would be referencing them by name or location um, or naming kind of any institution specific details. So, for example, explaining how much they want to live by the sea when they're applying to a Birmingham university would be a big no-no. Similarly, kind of mentioning something like an international business experience that's included in the fees. So I know at the University of Gloucestershire, there's kind of paid um, business experience. But if that's not something that's included at the other institutions they're applying for, of course, they shouldn't mention those sorts of things. Um, remember that, of course, they can't change their personal statement later on if they change their mind. And again, this would also be used for clearing. So if they're applying for kind of different subjects or courses, so perhaps, obviously I'm assuming that you would advise them to be applying for things which are quite similar, but I would always scour through, you know, the prospectuses, read the course descriptions really carefully and find those kind of common themes and skills. So is there a particular subject area that is um, covered by all five of the, of the courses they're applying for? If it really comes down to it and it's a case of perhaps they just need to be mentioning more of those kind of soft generic skills perhaps rather than really specific um, course related things. And of course if they're applying for a joint degree, so business and French or sports education and coaching, they should of course um, mention both aspects of the degree and talk about why they're interested in both and perhaps why they think they make a kind of a good combination for them as well. Okay, you'll be pleased. There's a little bit of uh, audience participation then on the next slide. So think about who reads it. So most of you have experience helping students write them, but who do we think actually reads um, these personal statements? So we're going to do a little show of hands. So first of all, I want you to kind of raise your hand if you think that... Um, uh, personal statements are actually read by the admissions teams. Let's have a little look. Oh, okay, maybe about a third of you. Okay, put your hands down then. So what about course leaders? So people who, you know, who are kind of in charge of the course. Okay quite a few of you. What about any other kind of lecturers, professors, you know, maybe the whole team who kind of work on that course? A couple, some of you saying everyone. Okay, any any other comments at all? And you can kind of jot those down, of course, um, in the comments box. If you have any other queries about who, or comments about who you think it might be who actually reads them. Oh, someone said student support services maybe. Okay, well actually the answer is that you don't know. Okay, so all institutions vary, so when I've kind of spoken to different people, they're all different and actually it might even vary by course as well. Um, I think the important thing, though, to stress to students is that kind of lack of, of knowing and therefore making their personal statement tailored, kind of tailoring it appropriately. So I think to tell them, you know, to remember that, of course, admissions tutors won't necessarily be experts in the field, so they should avoid using the like, acronyms and jargon, which would be kind of impenetrable to a, a, a non-subject expert. Um, an example for me, quite a funny one, I always think, is TA. Okay, so for me, as probably yourselves, you know, working in the kind of education sector, you probably think TA standing for teaching assistant. But for my military husband, okay, when I mention kind of TA, he always thinks territorial army. All right, so just a, just a little kind of example of how things could potentially be misleading. On the other hand, if a student were to be, um, if the student statement was to be read by a course leader, of course they would notice straight away if a student provided incorrect information, or maybe was kind of trying to talk about something that they didn't really understand. So, 
I think it's really important, it's all about balance, um, stress the importance of getting the statement read by a range of people with varied subject knowledge and making sure that that is done well adva in advance of the submission date. You know, get them to send it out to, um, you know, maybe parents, few friends, a subject teacher, a whole range of people. Okay, we've had a comment about lost sound, so I'm just checking. Please let me know if sound seems to have gone. Just adjusted my microphone, so hopefully that's a little bit clearer. Okay, statements. So um, you, I will show you later UCAS have actually published some of their kind of most overused words and sentences and things and I, I will kind of let you have a little peek at those if you haven't seen them already. One word I would say definitely to avoid is passion or passionate, okay, definitely kind of, you know, with that evidence side of things, make sure that your students are kind of showing how they're passionate rather than simply kind of stating it. So, it's these kind of empty state statements which are kind of haven't been evidence-based. These are the sorts of things that your students need to avoid. So, for example, I've loved sport all my life. Really? You know, did, did you arrive into this world doing keepy-uppies? Was your first word Beckham? Okay, I'm being a little bit tongue-in-cheek here, but was there actually a moment perhaps when that student maybe was about four years old, when their uncle perhaps took them to their first ever football match? Was it the atmosphere that kind of sparked their love of sport? Was it competing in a particular competition um, that made them think, actually, you know, I really enjoy sport. Perhaps I want to go on and coach others in that, in that field. Okay, so try and link it rather than this kind of generic statements of, loving things all their lives or always been interested in, try and maybe pinpoint it to a particular moment. Um, second one, I feel global warming is a really important issue. Again, I'm sure everyone in the 21st century would probably agree with this to some extent. But again, I'd actually want them to explain which aspects uh, um, are important and why. And how would that link to, you know, that physics degree perhaps that the student was um, um, applying for. Um, number three, again, you know, say something original or say something personal, how does that actually relate to them personally? And number four, you need teamwork and communication skills and I've got them. Okay, again, you know, without evidence, this statement lacks kind of any substance and I think it's actually borderline arrogant. So, you know, explain how they've got those communication skills, where they found that teamwork and why that they think that that is really key to the course they're applying for. Okay, so I mentioned um, at the beginning the Sutton Trust report, um, making a statement, you can go and have a look on it online, it's quite an interesting read. What I've done is I've just pulled off a couple of bits from that report to have a little look at. So what I want you to do is have a little think, all right, if you haven't read the report already, of course. So would this statement here actually increase the chances of an applicant gaining a place on their chosen course, or do you think it would decrease their chances? Okay, could you write your answers um, in the box now? So do you think it would increase the chances or decrease? And perhaps if you want to, maybe also write why. Why would you think that? So I assume that this person's applying for a law degree. Um, captivated by the all-encompassing importance of the law in society, I'm amazed at the way crime is moderated and um, precedents are set and how they construct the nature of the world around us. Would you think increase or decrease? And Jackie, yes, we will um, give you the link to the Sutton Trust um, document as well. well. I'll pop that into kind of the FAQs. All right, interesting so far. But mainly decreasing, decrease, waffle, non-specific, decrease, decrease. Decrease, too clever a 
and no substance. Caroline decrease in capital letters. <laughs> um, look, so again, too generic, looking for something more specific. Okay, uh, Chris is questioning amazed. Yeah, again. Okay, so the actual results, all right, so in that Sutton Trust report, a teacher believed that this statement would increase the likelihood the applicant would be offered a place by showing, and I'll quote, clear enthusiasm. But the admissions tutor said, and again, I'll quote the admissions tutor, and you all seem to be very much in agreement with, with them. This is an empty opening statement with no examples cited to back it up. The weak attempt to define law waste space and provides no useful details about the applicant. All right, and again, it picks up all the sorts of things that I said earlier about make it personal, okay? Provide evidence, okay? Yeah, I completely agree with you. Way too much waffle. It's just, you know, putting in things to sound a bit clever or to sound a bit enthusiastic, but it doesn't really tell the institution anything. So I'm going to have a look at a second example. Again, I think this is somebody uh, applying for medicine. So what about this example? Um, while shadowing in GI surgery, I observed necrotic pancreatitis patient in severe septic shock. You can tell that I am not of a medical background at all, can't you? But, you know, again, reading that example, do you think that it would increase or decrease the chances of this candidate getting onto the course of their choice? Got a few of you going for increase. Increase. I don't know if this is just because you're thinking I'm probably going to put in a bit of a mixture. Increase. Oh, a couple of decrease. Uh, Kathleen says increase since it uses a real life example. Yeah, and that is what I've been kind of going on about recently, isn't it? Um, Okay, so the teacher actually thought there was too much medical information, it was long and impersonal, and I have to say this is actually only a portion of the sample that's provided in the full report. It was actually about three times the length, um, the quote that the, that the Sutton Trust printed. Um, however, the admissions tutor said, you know, similar sorts of things to you, excellent analysis of a complex case, the student actually shows the understanding of communication skills rather than simply stating how important they are. And again, you know, I think the most important thing is to tell students to evidence their statements. Okay, and I said, didn't I, that I was going to share some of those um, sentences from UCAS that they published recently. So, you know, it's all about trying to get them to be original. So UCAS have shared their most popular personal statement openers. These are just the top five that were actually used in the 2015 cycle. And you can see how many times they were used by the brackets on the right hand side. Okay, so again, you know, lots of them, they're very vague, aren't they? You know, very, very vague about from a young age, for as long as I can remember, you know, try and get them to pinpoint something specific. Okay, here's another question for you then. It's all about being original. So in one single year, how many students wrote this exact sentence word for word in their personal statement. Okay, write your answer in the box. So in one year, how many wrote exactly that sentence, word for word? Okay, 250, 958, 350, 1,000, 100, 142 would have found it on the website. Okay, huge range. Well, the answer is perhaps not as high as some of you have said, but 234 UCAS personal statements in one single year um, use that exact 
sentence. And again, it's just to stress that um, UCAS have the copy catch software. It's used to check against past and present statements. So, you know, make sure, of course, that um, students aren't necessarily borrowing from kind of siblings or cousins or perhaps older friends who manage to get onto their kind of dream course. And of course, from those on kind of websites, books or anything else. It might be really tempting for them to kind of borrow sections from the model that you provide in school or maybe go onto the student room and lift a few phrases from someone who kind of got onto their, their perfect course, but they really shouldn't plagiarise. So, of course, you know, universities will be informed if they're caught um, and take appropriate action depending on the situation, kind of how severe that is. And I think, you know, they should stress that, yes, they might still get onto their course if it's maybe just one sentence that they kind of had borrowed, but it's not a great way to start three years when they've already got a kind of mark against their name as someone who's kind of potentially um, plagiarised. Okay, so... Just to kind of summarise, really, the, the way that they should go about writing their personal statement, some kind of top style tips. Um, having a little look at that set, that uh, list of words, I'm sure the more creative of you could probably make these into kind of a snazzy mnemonic for your students or something. Um, I don't know, perhaps put your ideas in the question box, perhaps. But these are the things that I think are really important to, um, to tell them about. In terms of formality, there's no need to sound posh or impressive. Students should write in a formal style that's kind of akin to that that they'd use in their A-level or their BTEC coursework and their exams. They um, do not have to address the admissions tutor directly. They should use kind of first or third person. In terms of um, vocabulary that they're using, I always tell them about the situation. Um, if any of them have seen that episode of Friends, maybe you've seen it where Joey actually writes a letter to the adoption agency for Monica and Chandler and he goes a little bit mad with the thesaurus and he ends up signing off baby kangaroo Tribbiani uh, you know instead of obviously Joey Tribbiani and I think it's a it's a good example that if students are tempted to kind of overuse the thesaurus they need to be really careful um, they're making sure that they're using vocabulary in the kind of correct context and likewise you know be mindful about what I said earlier about trying to kind of put in too much kind of jargon that's that's just not needed personal everything should be about the student who's actually applying I think wherever possible they should draw on their own experiences and their own kind of aspirations I actually think, I know it has been kind of maybe fashionable in the past to kind of put in quotes from philosophical people or world leaders or subject experts, but I actually think this is a little bit cheesy, potentially a bit irrelevant. I think it's much better for institutions to hear from um, a kind of a, the student's voice. In terms of evidence, back up everything they say. Concise, so avoid repetition, group similar experiences and skills together within the same paragraph. Or I think a better thing to do is actually to um, choose to focus on and kind of demonstrate a different skill for each experience they have. So for example, rather than kind of talking about the fantastic teamwork skills that they use in hockey, and then again when they kind of use their teamwork in a group business studies project, why not focus on a different skill for each? So maybe talk about the teamwork when they're playing hop hockey at the weekends, but then the presentation skills that they use for their business studies um, group project. In terms of accuracy, spell check, spell check, spell check. Remember I said earlier about a couple of little errors could maybe undo all their hard work and make it look sloppy, which you will obviously know is not the case at all, but that's not necessarily true for an institution who's never met them before. Um, in terms of spell checking, again, making sure that they're using an English rather than an American software. And in terms of accuracy as well, making sure everything is true. Okay, no popping in any extra little lies or anything in there. And this is the big question to ask them. When they're looking at their statement, does it increase their chances of getting accepted onto a course or not? And if the answer is no, leave it out. So I hope you 
found that really helpful. Um, you can, uh, I'll, I'll leave the kind of information open, leave the question box open for another couple of minutes in case you've got any extra comments or questions that you'd like us to put together and we can get those answered for you. Um, there'll also be a couple of poll questions which will pop up onto your screen just so you can kind of give us a little bit of feedback about how you found the session this afternoon. Um, and it's been really good um, speaking to you all this afternoon. So thank you very much. On behalf of Grows, um, I wish you all the best luck with helping your students with their personal statements. Thank you very much.